you want to open your Bibles up to your Old Testament right now, we're going to be spending most of our time actually in the text of Proverbs. Um, sometimes when we think about the text of Proverbs, um, it is in a mindset or a concept where this is all about practical life lived. And there is no doubt that a, a segment of the wisdom literature and the proverb text in particular is angled towards that specific goal in that it's helping us understand what it's like to be a follower of God in a world that doesn't make sense. It will explain to us principles of spiritual success and rebellion. It will give us insight into the maturing of our faith as men and women in the sight of God. And a lot of times it has very specific wisdom that helps us figure out some of the most complex moments of our lives. But deeply woven through the text of Proverbs is a continual message that echoes from that text every other part of the Bible. It is in part what I mentioned as an uh, introduction and, uh, and a call for our worship today in that this God whom we serve is our God. And this God whom we serve is a God whose character, whose attributes are the very substance of what it is to be a disciple. There is a fundamental and practical reality that exists in all of humanity. In many ways, we deeply appreciate it and recognize it in that we become whom we follow. It happens in the home. It happens in the world. It happens at work. It happens in school. It happens in our friendships. We reframe that statement in a number of ways. We might say things like, we become the average of the people we surround ourselves with, or whatever you read is what you become. Uh, we even say it in a literal sense in that we become the things that we eat. You are what you eat. But on a very basic level, the most foundational principle of the development of disciples comes from the reality that we serve and follow God. And not God as a concept, concept, not God as an idea, but a living God whose character matters, whose commitment to his creation matters. Fundamentally, then, one of the best things that you can do if your desire is to become like God, like Jesus, like the Spirit, and as Paul himself would say in an accommodative sense, follow me as I follow Christ, then we should richly surround ourselves with time spent reading the Word of God because the more acquainted we are with whom he is, the more likely it is that we make choices like he would. We've learned from him. Proverbs can sometimes be described in an accommodative sense as how to foolproof your life. That's a really bad dad joke if you didn't catch it because Proverbs is full of really foolish behavior. But one of the most important principles underneath that is to recognize that we stop being a fool when we acknowledge where wisdom comes from. And in the text of the Bible, it reads, this is Proverbs 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. You can survive in life and be successful while knowing very little about a lot of things. All of us are actually evidence of that. There are things that you and I deeply rely on on a daily basis that we probably have zero knowledge as to how it actually happens. It happens when we go to the doctors and they give us great care and they rescue our physical forms from the ailments that we encounter. 
It happens with even minor functions of the circumstances around our life. But you can't really make it far without knowing God. Because there's a terminus that exists in all of humanity. A.W. Tozer wrote that it is impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inward attitudes right while our idea of God is erroneous or inaccurate. If we would bring back spiritual power to our lives, we must begin to think of God more nearly as he is. Our attitude and perspective about who God is drives our behavior. Another way to think about it is to think about, maybe you've got this at your house, those old family albums full of photos of your loved ones. But imagine doing it this way. Your photo album is right in front of you and you spend all your time staring at those photos instead of closing the photo album and engaging with the people in the photos who are also in the room with you. Which of those two things is going to result in a better, more real outcome? See, if we have a desire to know God and we think we get to know him simply by looking at the couple of photos that we've chosen to put in the book. We haven't grown any closer than when we first began. The essence of idolatry, by the way, and you think about what idolatry looks like, is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of God himself. When we make God less than he actually is, We have actually created our own idol. Think about the text of Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3. It's idolatry in practice. So going back to that first passage I mentioned, and we'll read again now, in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, we're going to recognize a basic attribute about God, in that God himself is, by his very nature, holy. Because again it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The very basic nature of God is his apartness, separateness. I want you to think about that for a moment, because very often when we talk about the holiness of God, we get hung up on what we consider our Biblical words, we got to do Bible words to describe these things, and we create complicated terms. Sometimes we can't even say the words to describe something that is a basic concept. So when the Bible uses the word holy, Old Testament or New Testament, it always has a basic meaning, separate or set apart, usually for a reason. There's a reason why it's separate. But for our purposes right now, as it's used here, In this Proverbs text, it's actually being used with a slight nuance. It means completely different or wholly other. It's not separate because of purpose. It's separate because it's not like the rest. I think probably all of us have seen photos and engaged in games and says, one of these things is not like the others. And you look at it and go, what's different? In the case of God, he is uniquely different than everything else. 1 John 1, verse 5 reads, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. The very nature of God's otherness, separateness, is built around the premise of that His character is without blemish or scar. In life, we all will eventually encounter 
the moments, the settings, the situations, the places where we or the world will harm ourselves or harm us. Those scars carry with us through life. They change the way we see things. They create our insecurities. They build our anxieties. Sometimes we triumph over them, and sometimes they weigh us down. And that distinction begins our understanding of what it means to have God be holy. That he doesn't have those scars of, our, of his failures, because there are none. But we need to make one more step. Because God's holiness, his otherness, isn't simply because he's not defiled, he hasn't broken himself or been broken. He's not some sort of sterilized surgical instrument. God's holiness actually is a positive attribute. It's not the absence of defilement. It's the refined fire of his nature. In Revelation 15 and verse 2, it reads the text this way. It says, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and all those who had conquered the beast and his image at the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. It's built on the picture of God's nature from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29, that our God is a consuming fire. It's saying that the holiness of God is so striking and so persistent that it's not just the idea that there's no defilement there or there has been no defilement there. It's that it's so powerful, it pushes it all out. His nature is so holy in its otherness his hate for sin is so significant that there's no room for it there. It can't grow root. That's why in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 17, it would read, Haughty eyes, lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devise wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, one who sows discord among brothers, the little text is not just a litany of things that God kind of isn't comfortable with. They are a representation of the conflict between the holiness of God and the world's way. And God's holiness is so abundantly powerful, it not only despises them, it burns it out from the space around him. Furthermore, pay attention to this. This again comes from the text of Proverbs, but understand the why it exists. In Proverbs 29 and verse 1, the scripture reads, He who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. This is a biblical premise and a, a spiritual concept of what happens to the course of your soul and your mindset and your ideas when you start to stiffen or restrain or push against God's correction. Eventually, you're hardened so greatly that you snap, that you're broken. Because God's power is not going to be resisted. It's a dangerous thing to start playing with sin, especially when you acknowledge that in doing so, you're denying and defying the God who made you. But God is not merely the powerful, all-consuming nature of His holiness. Beyond that, God's sovereign nature comes into play. The fact that God is holy and just gives us an understanding of the universe itself. I don't know who said it first, but many have said that history is His story. I like that play in words because also I like playing words. But I think it helps us understand how God's nature interacts with the world around us. In the text of Proverbs, again, there are two passages that help us understand the rulership or sovereign nature of God. Foremost, Proverbs 16 and verse 4, which read, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. And then Proverbs 19 and verse 21, which read, Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord 
that will stand. You may also remember that in Paul's writing to the church at Colossae, he says, all things were created by him and for him concerning the Christ, that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end of all things. The divine sovereign nature of God helps us understand how everything functions and everything interacts with one another. It doesn't limit or remove our individual responsibility. It helps us understand how it works. That we have a place and a space in the creation that God has made, but it is subject to whom God is. It is secondary to his nature. And God even promises to give us wisdom to understand some of those things. When he makes statements like James chapter 1 and verse 5, that our prayer to God should be focused upon asking for his wisdom. And at times we give that wisdom that we gain from God to those who surround us. You think about these two passages in the text of Proverbs that help us now see practical illustrations of his sovereign nature. In Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 15, by me kings rule or reign, and rulers decree what is just. Or Proverbs 21 and verse 1, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. I want you to think about those two texts as they interplay with one another and the world's workings right now. God raises kings and nations. The psalmists also declare these same truths. He rules with his sovereign hand in all matters. He even in context, and we've already read this earlier, is in charge of the rebellious nations as a sovereign king. That helps us understand and trust in God's rulership of the nation. And perhaps also not worry about the small details that frustrate us so often. God's sovereign commitment to us is even seen in his plan to call us back. His intention and design to bring about our rescue weaves its way through a history full of men and nations and rulerships that seemed intent on causing their own elevation and God's dismissal. If you were to track from the hubris of Babel and Babylon, to the hubris of today, you've seen that same stream of I'm in charge, man rules his environment, behavior take place. And yet, Paul again, writing the text of Romans in chapter 1, it reminds us that God's power is sufficient to bring about our reconciliation and restoration. It has the capacity to renew our souls and the ability to do so in the midst of any nation. In Psalm 93, in verse 1, it reads, The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, he has put on strength at his belt. Yet the world is established, it shall never be moved. When the Lord reigns, it means he's king over all the things. Every ounce of it. Further think about how that extends to the physical universe itself. That's, by the way, one of the areas where most of us probably don't have a good grasp of how actually all that works. Like, we may have a little functioning knowledge of, yeah, I know there's planets, and I know that there's uh, heavenly entities that kind of swirl around each other, and there's these, like, black hole things, and, um, you know, dying stars, and collapsing stars, and quarks, and fields, and all that stuff. We might know a little bit. But all of those things work together as a system. And they play off of one another. Even down to the way in which the gravitational forces of the moon affect the, the rising and falling of the tides on our little planet in the midst of the grand unified universe. 
God is king of all those things which were made by him and for him. Further, our God's character that goes from his otherworldliness, his otherness, to his rulership finds root in the character of his concern for us. In our Bible class, we read the text of the Gospel of Luke in chapter 12 where the raven is used as a teaching tool to tell us about God's value of us. But it's not just that. And this ties into the uniform nature of the character of God in that no matter which covenant you labored within, whether it was the general covenant between God and mankind that echoes from the garden, do what I ask, or if it's the specific covenants, like the covenant to Israel or the covenant in Christ, God's care is seen in the way he cares for those who cannot care for themselves. In the Old Testament, the text of Leviticus, Exodus, Deuteronomy, all echo with responsibility to those who are oppressed and poor, to the widows, to the vulnerable, to the strangers, to the broken. God provided care for them, from the gleaning to the offerings. So it also is in the New Testament, where in specific terms, their care is emphasized in the communities of Christians that they're part of. But notice this in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 31, where it reads, Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Or Proverbs 22 and verse 2, where it reads, To the rich and the poor, or the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. That first text in Proverbs 14 is a simple admonition that we can choose to dishonor or honor God out of our abundance in the way we treat those who do not have the blessings that we share. But thir- further is a biblical illustration of a worldly principle that sometimes shows itself in striking ways. We all recognize this. If you've ever played chess, after you beat me, which is a pretty easy task to do, on the chessboard, you know where the king and the pawn go? Back into the same box. So it is for you and I. Whether we be kings or paupers, at the end of our days, we all end up in a box. And so when the Proverbs tell us here in chapter 22 and verse 2, that the rich and the poor meet together, Their Lord is the maker of them all. He's telling us that same basic truth. We then have a choice, whether we be poor or rich. Do we honor God in the middle space? Do we honor God in our commitment to a kingdom-focused mindset? God's compassion is shown in all of the structural laws of both the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. Whether it is property laws, honoring the ownership of physical blessings granted to humans, whether it is the relational laws of honoring those bounds of marriage and commitment, they all have to do with that same sense of compassion, of care for the other person. Whether it's don't steal, don't commit adultery. Those are all actually built on a premise of compassion and care. Further, one more thing, and this is the one that I think we most often recognize of God, but maybe don't often apply. That God himself has the capacity to provide for us wisdom and guidance that we need. In the text of Proverbs, it reads, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open, and the clouds drop down the dew. God's wisdom, God's nature is revealed through the reality of him creating all things. His insight will always be stronger and more clear than any ounce of great ideas you or I 
and come up with. Isaac Watts has one of the lyrics to a known song of his that adds these additional thoughts. He says, I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. The compassionate creator of the universe who stands apart from mankind grants us insight into the knowledge of the workings of the world. How good it is for us then to have that privilege, to be able to listen to what God has declared, consider his message, and then make good use of it. For it says in Proverbs 2 and verse 6, For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. A.W. Tozer, who I quoted at the beginning of the lesson, I'll quote again at the end, he says, With the goodness of God to desire our highest welfare, the wisdom of God to plan it, and the power of God to achieve it, what do we lack? Life is full with opportunity to feel like we are simply biding our time or holding our place or spinning our wheels. I will suggest to you that our lives are and should be always advancing. We have every single thing that we actually need and so many things that are blessings beyond it whether it be as a church, a family, or a disciple. So I want to encourage everyone before we pray to think deeply about what you see your future looking like. I want to encourage everyone to think resoundingly on how that image will change the more you know who God is. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the blessing that it is to have and to know you through your word. Help us to have the kind of confidence in you that not only do we declare you as Lord, our lives declare that you are Lord of us. Help us to have the commitment to your message that we change our lives to be more like you and less like the world. Help us to listen to the evidence that comes from creation and from your power and from your word that testifies to your other nature, your holy nature, and that we who follow you would rise to a willingness to be holy like you. Forgive us of our sins and help us grow. This is our prayer in your son's name. Amen.